I thought it would be just a good idea to recap a lot of the things that have happened over the last 10 years in Bitcoin. Um, regularly in discussion with people, I hear them say things like, oh, I never knew that happened, or something like that. And it's like, have you researched the history of Bitcoin in depth? Clearly not. So um, it's always good to refresh as well on a lot of things that happen, because some people do forget there's so much going on uh, in the cryptocurrency space and uh, like just in everyone's different lives. So uh, let's have a look from the beginning. Um, well, the first thing that uh, happened is when the Bitcoin.org domain was registered by an anonymous person uh, in August 2008. And shortly after that, the uh, Bitcoin white paper was published by Satoshi Nakamoto to a cryptography mailing list at metsdow.com and it describes uh, the digital currency, uh, Bitcoin and peer-to-peer electronic cash system. And that could also be accessed from the bitcoin.org website. <clears throat> so then on the white paper here, um, clearly uh, this is meant to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. There appears to be some confusion among certain groups of people about what Bitcoin actually is. And it's pretty clear right here um, that it was meant to be for payments and there are other indicators uh, on it being used as such uh, in its early days and it achieved great success and the price also benefited uh, from acting as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. I just have a thought, how did that anonymous person pay for that registration, do you know? Bitcoin.org? I haven't looked into it uh, myself, but I'm pretty sure normally, uh, yeah, it tells you who owns the domain. You can like contact them in some some way. But uh, I know now a lot of domains do accept Bitcoin payments, like uh, Namecheap.com. You can go and buy domains and stuff there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, hang on. I think I did look into it, and I think he must have done it with cash somehow uh, th through some strange method. He bought it with cash. So yeah, you can go check that out. I think that's how it was done. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, the reason uh, well, Bitcoin functions like cash does in our society today, and it's a suitable option for purchasing both goods and services in the real world and online. Um, and then later in January 2009, uh, this is the day when the Genesis block on Bitcoin was mined. So the first event happened on the Bitcoin blockchain ever, and that was a transaction from Satoshi Nakamoto to Hal Finney. And uh, embedded in that block, there was some data that had the title of a newspaper that was released about a week earlier. And it said, uh, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for the banks. And that was a newspaper from the 3rd of January that year. And uh, yeah, it was basically embedded in that block um, to basically demonstrate the reason why there's a need for Bitcoin in the world. Um, and it's clearly meant to replace the banking system or at least challenge them. So shortly after that, there's some quotes from Satoshi to another earlier developer, uh, Mike Hearn. So this is in April 2009 now. Mike Hearn was a developer at Google working full time there and he came to do Bitcoin related activities and development uh, along with Gavin and Drayson in the very early days in their spare time while working full time job. Um, but yeah, basically Satoshi was saying uh, he knew that Bitcoin could scale very easily to go and surpass Visa and MasterCard and obsolete these systems. and. Um, Later down the track, hardware and uh, networks, uh, the capacity of both of those and the affordability of both of those greatly increases over time. And uh, definitely since 2009, 10 years later, there has been an undeniable uh, and substantial change in both of those. This is just a diagram that I found uh, that is basically comparing on the right hand side, a uh, number of cryptocurrencies where they stand now as far as transactions per second go and comparing that to Visa, um, which is basically the fastest uh, payment network at the moment. 
And Visa is a 60-year-old company right now. Uh, they're capable of doing 24,000 transactions per second. Uh, one version of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, it has been tested up to 380 gigabyte size blocks. And that was doing uh, 2,600,000 transactions per second. And that's 100 times of what Visa can do. And uh, there's been many research papers put out, one suggesting uh, that uh, 7 million transactions per second are feasible with Bitcoin on one terabyte size blocks. And that is ultimately the goal for a number of uh, development teams working on Bitcoin. So we've got the first documented Bitcoin transactions for goods. And this was done by a Bitcoin Talk user by the name of Laszlo. He put out a post. We've got the screenshot at the bottom there uh, where he's putting out an offer basically for someone to uh, exchange pizza to him for 10,000 bitcoins and another user did meet his offer and I think they just uh, called up the pizza place and got it delivered by credit card um, and yeah that guy then made the transaction with this other user online and he spent 10,000 bitcoins for two pizzas I think and uh, yeah at the peak of the last bull market it was worth uh, those 10,000 bitcoins would have been worth 200 million US dollars. Uh, but at the time when he bought the pizza, it was only 41 US dollars. So that's how much it, uh, how, how far it's come since then. It, like, well, there was only, there was probably uh, only like so one wallet available uh, back then. In the UK, I think the UK paid for a pizza in the US. It was basically only desktop wallets back then. There was no such thing as uh, scanning QR codes and stuff. It yeah. was just the public keys. And um, yeah, they would have just exchanged that online and he would have used the wallet. Like I think the, uh, the Bitcoin Core software uh, that runs the protocol, the node, I think that even had a wallet built in. So that's what he probably would have been using back then. And then more stuff that happened in 2010. Uh, the first Bitcoin exchange launched and it was known as Bitcoin Market. And um, then a few months later, we had the infamous Mt. Gox. And uh, by 2013, that one was handling over 70% of all Bitcoin transactions worldwide. Um, and as we know later what happened to that, might get to that soon. Um, but on the 7th of December, 2010, another use on Bitcoin talk Double Eck creates a Bitcoin app for the Nokia N900, and uh, this was the first mobile wallet. So he was able to send uh, 0.42 BTC from one user. Uh, one user sent that to him on a mobile device on that date, and yeah, that was the first mobile payment ever recorded. Then we've got the Silk Road. So the Silk Road came onto the scene in February 2011. And basically, this was just an online free marketplace, and it was accessible via the dark web. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to use Tor browser to access that. Um, and the currency of this marketplace was Bitcoin. That's what they chose to use, and it rose in popularity greatly um, because it was a free market, and generally that tends to be what happens there. But they did have a few rules. Uh, there's no child porn, <laughs> porn, no scams, and no sale of anything that could harm someone else. But you could buy like drugs and everything else on there and uh, a lot of other stuff. Um, so yeah, that's why it became really popular. And it became so popular that Ross Ulbricht had to hire a small team of staff to uh, you know, support the uh, many thousands of users they had. So during the peak uh, days of the site's popularity, it had almost 1 million users and the transaction uh, transactions going through there each month accounted for 2 million to 7 million US dollars. So that's a lot of money, a lot of Bitcoin being sent around for buying goods and services. And uh, yeah, ultimately this succeeded because back then Bitcoin, it was uh, a good alternative for banking is fast, reliable, and low cost to transact. I remember when I discovered Bitcoin in uh, mid-2016, uh, it was taking like three days to do a bank transfer here. 
and it was, I was just blown away because I just sent money from point A to point B instantly, and that's uh, basically why it was so great. Uh, no middlemen involved. And also, the other benefit of this was that it's a push, not a pull system. So if you uh, sign up for a direct debit or something like that, they may just take money out of your account without you noticing uh, until you see your bank statement. And Bitcoin, you can't do that. Uh, you as the owner of the Bitcoins need to sign the transaction and push it to the, uh, to the miners. And then we've got the departure of Satoshi Nakamoto in April 2011. Uh, this is when Gavin Andreessen announced on BitcoinTalk.org that he had been invited to the CIA headquarters to talk about Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, basically after he told Satoshi this uh, by emails, that's normally how they all communicated, he just uh, kind of disappeared. Uh, but before he left, it was found out a few years later in 2013, uh, the developer Mike Hearn uh, released some emails, the last correspondence he had with Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, it was basically, he said that he'd moved on to other things, but now the project is in good hands. Um, so yeah, basically it appears that he left uh, after the CIA started looking into Bitcoin uh, and monitoring what's going on there, inviting Gavin to come and talk to them about it. And we don't know much more about uh, what went on there at this talk. Uh, and I think some people have requested the information from them, but they have uh, denied those requests. So um, a few things of importance that happened over the next couple of years. <clears throat> 2011, again, 25% um, of Bitcoins that could ever exist have been mined at that point. So, yeah, out of the 21 million, the 21 million hard cap, 25% of those were mined. In February of 2011, Bitcoin reached parity with one US dollar. So, one BTC was one dollar. And then 2011, we have WikiLeaks and a number of other organizations started to accept Bitcoin for donations. Uh, at the time, they had been getting censored from like PayPal and uh, like Visa and MasterCard, and they sought out Bitcoin as an alternative for receiving donations to do what they do. And uh, it turns out that that was the best decision they could have ever made because uh, they've been receiving Bitcoin since 2011, and uh, they've got a lot of funding now because the price has gone up. Um, and then over these years, 2011 to 2014. Gavin Andreessen, who was handed the keys to the project, uh, started letting in a number of other people access to the Bitcoin Core GitHub repository, where they make changes to the code for Bitcoin. Um, 28th of November 2012, this was where the first halving occurred and the block reward went from 50 BTC to 25 BTC per block. 22nd of January 2013, BitPay surpassed 10,000 transactions. I also saw recently that they announced some uh, amazing record for how much uh, money they processed in 2018, but I can't remember that amount. It was uh, amazing though. I think it was uh, a billion. A bil billion? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so too. It was definitely over a billion yeah, yeah. Uh, US dollars worth of transactions. <laughs> yeah. So then we got 1st of April 2013, Bitcoin. Uh, went past $100 before reaching $200 for the first time a week later. Um, 2nd October 2013, Silk Road, after a few years of operation, it was shut down uh, and it caused a big price drop. The, big, uh, the FBI had seized 144,000 bitcoins worth about $30 million at the time from Ross Ulbricht. And if you don't know what happened there, they had been uh, kind of tracking uh, trying to find out where the servers for Silk Road were located, they managed to find out where they were, and then they backtracked it to a personal email address of his. And yeah, basically they started investigating him more. And one day they uh, sprung him in a coffee shop on his laptop there, logged into Silk Road administrator account, uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts, his account was called, and. Uh, yeah, basically they took the computer off him and arrested him and he's been in prison for like the last six years now. So hopefully that guy gets out at some point soon. 
but uh, that caused the price to go down significantly. Uh, and then we've got, in February 2014, the next year now, Mt Gox suspended the withdrawals before filing for bankruptcy. Um, and there was up to 745,000 Bitcoin stolen there. And there was a massive price drop. Um, and now, actually, the longest running exchange, I believe, is Bitstamp after Mt Gox, um, which has been down for a number of years now, obviously. Uh, in August 2014, Gavin Andreessen, who was the lead developer of the project, stepped down, uh, and he stepped down as the release manager of Bitcoin Core as well. So now other people that he'd invited into the project took on this role. And another important note here is that in the 23rd of October 2014, uh, this is when the company Blockstream was founded, and the CTO, uh, Adam Back, CTO Gregory Maxwell, uh, among a number of other people who formed the company, they all had uh, Bitcoin Core commit access. Uh, so they also announced their intent during this period that they were going to develop sidechains like the Lightning Network and their Liquid and some other stuff. Um, so that's an important thing to note because these are, and we'll talk more about what they did later, um, but just keep that in mind. December 2014, Microsoft, a massive company, big tech company, I'm sure everyone knows, they began to accept Bitcoin as a method of payment. So you could uh, buy like Xbox games and software from their online store there, and it was really great. Uh, during this period, a number of other merchants started picking Bitcoin up as a method of payment. Um, and in August 2015, it was estimated that 160,000 merchants globally were now accepting Bitcoin payments. So since 2009, uh, 160,000 merchants, that's pretty great effort, I think. Where did you get that number from? The internet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to a conference in 2017, was it? there was a guy there who was involved, a, a lawyer who was there from, um, involved in the Malcox liquidation. Yep. And so it was actually it's like the interesting thing with the price at that point, it was about. Exactly. And what all would be paid out of Bitcoin. So the, um, so the, the thing that they had to do is step out of bankruptcy and go back to administration. The other, other Japanese law, they couldn't distribute Bitcoin. They could only distribute the, the cash. Yep. And they've never done that. So they back to yeah. administration and now they're distributing. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, I would definitely be wanting my Bitcoins as well, not US dollars. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, yeah, around 2015, uh, the block size debate started heating up, and everyone's probably heard a lot about this. Um, but basically, the repository, after adding a number of new individuals to the uh, tab administrator and comment access on there, and keep in mind that uh, this is when the CIA had been previously known to be taking interest in Bitcoin in 2011, um, this group of people basically uh, were against increasing the block size to allow more transactions to be made on Bitcoin. And so people were starting to get concerned, like, you know, the usage is picking up with all these new merchants and people starting to use it globally. What are we going to do? And so uh, the early developer, Mike Hearn, who had been around since basically the very beginning, and also this Gavin and Drayson, they had uh, worked together on something called Bitcoin XT, and that was just an alternate protocol implementation to the Bitcoin Core protocol. But this one was uh, increasing the block size limit to eight megabytes. So back in this time, uh, it quickly gained a lot of support, and in particular among miners. So the biggest miners of that time period, F2 Pool, BTC, China, and Pool and Huobi stated that they wanted the eight megabyte blocks 
and they put together a signed statement regarding that. Um, and then in 2015, again, June 2015, um, all the nodes, so miners or even people who were downloading that at home and not mining, but mostly miners running Bitcoin XT, they were attacked with denial of service attacks all throughout the year. Uh, in June, again, uh, Gavin Andreessen concluded his final work on Bitcoin with the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 101. And the proposal was to increase the block size limit. That was his final work for Bitcoin. Um, in August 2015, Bitcoin XT uh, continued to receive a lot of attacks towards it. And Adam Back, the CTO, uh, sorry, the CEO of Blockstream, called Bitcoin XT a coup. And this is despite the fact that Bitcoin is open source and nobody controls it or owns it. So you can see there. I also included a screenshot uh, from the Bitcoin XT Reddit forum, and it's from uh, about this period. Uh, no operator is saying that he was uh, had a experienced a DDoS attack. And it took down his entire internet service provider in a rural area. And everyone within five towns of his location lost their internet uh, server connection for several hours because of the attacks. So it was clearly uh, a very well-funded uh, attack and all this to sustain such things for so long and also uh, just the sheer amount of connections that were attempting to be made with those nodes in the first place. So, yeah, by doing this, it was discouraging people from hosting the nodes or using this software. Uh, and then we went through a period of mass censorship on all the online forums for Bitcoin. So the main place where people were doing all the discussions in the early days was bitcointalk.org, uh, and that kind of moved to Reddit but uh, they were both moderated by uh, the same guy. His name's Thamos, that's the alias. And uh, he's basically in charge on both these places. And basically what he did there, he decided that enough was enough. And any posts about uh, block size debate from any side will be deleted uh, unless they introduce something that is like a new idea about the subject. So from that point on, the discussion about that was closed. And uh, if you mentioned Bitcoin XT, you would be banned. So an alternate subreddit was actually created during this period. Um, well, it probably already existed before, but people started migrating over there to go and have free and open uh, discussion that was not censored. Um, and there is actually, this all this stuff is very well documented. Um, a recommended read from me would be the Medium article that I've got on the right there. So if you like type in on Google Medium John Block, and uh, he's got two articles about this, and I think the second one's even more extensive than the first. Uh, and yeah, basically that quote down the bottom on the left is pretty uh, relevant. Anyone who's denying that uh, Reddit Bitcoin is heavily censored is either lying to themselves or lying to you, or alternatively, uh, they're either stupid or they're in on it, basically. So then we've got, after this year, in 2015, 2016 had the departure of Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen, both these early developers who were there from the beginning, and uh, the guy who was handed the keys from Satoshi himself. So, uh, yeah, in January, that's when Mike Hearn uh, put a lengthy post on his blog on his website, uh, which is also a recommended read from me. It's pretty long, but it goes into a lot of what happened in that particular time period. It was all very well documented. There's, like, charts and everything. Um, and basically explains what went wrong with the Bitcoin project. And uh, in that little excerpt then there that I've got from the start of it basically said Bitcoin has at this point failed. Um, and then we've got in uh, May 2016, uh, Gavin Andreessen wrote a blog post and he said that he believed Craig Wright was in fact Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, this was of course very controversial and the other developers on the Bitcoin core repository um, saw this as him having been hacked and they removed him and uh, like revoked his administrator and commit privileges 
uh, for that repository. And the next day, he actually spoke at a consensus in New York, that big conference, and he confirmed to everyone that he had not been hacked. Um, but despite that, uh, they did not reinstate the administrative privileges for him, uh, and it hasn't been ever since then. Is it on Medium that uh, it's on his own website. Uh, it looks kind of looks like that. If you just search Mike Hearn in that title, yeah. um, you should be able to easily find it in Google. Um, there's a few other things that happened during this period. Uh, kind of not as relevant because it was just a waste of time, but uh, there was a bunch of different agreements that were attempted. And uh, uh, it's still it's about the scaling and coming to a consensus over what the upgrade path should be. And um, yeah, basically they all failed. There was first uh, an agreement in Hong Kong where they said we'll upgrade to two megabytes and also implement segregated witness, which is what the core developers had wanted at that time period. And, and of course the miners wanted to increase the block size uh, and a lot of businesses as well who were, you know, their businesses were built on Bitcoin. And so they, as transactions were increasing, they obviously wanted to uh, support more customers. Uh, so anyway, uh, after that, that agreement failed. Uh, there were some other protocol implementations that attempted to uh, gain support after Bitcoin XT left as well. So we had Bitcoin Unlimited, who's actually still around to this day. Um, and there was one called Bitcoin Classic as well, which that one failed. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there was another agreement um, called Segwit2x. And basically, yeah, that one failed as well because um, they said they wanted to implement SegWit first and then months later, only months later, then once they got what they wanted, the other side could have a two megabyte upgrade. Um, but anyway, uh, they ended up dropping that two megabyte agreement in the end. The block size is still one megabyte capped, but Segregated Witness is able to compile um, and make the blocks more efficient uh, doing what it does. Uh, but yeah, they ended up dropping that because a group of people decided to uh, create their own protocol implementation. This was known as Bitcoin ABC, where they did not have segregated witness. They had uh, an eight megabyte block size increase and they also removed some features that were added, like replaced by fee, which was something that was introduced uh, to deal with the high transaction fees and transactions getting stuck. So when you uh, sent a transaction and it was not being processed because you didn't choose the right fee, it allowed you to send another transaction and overwrite the previous one, but you, this time you sent a higher fee. And this also introduced some risk for merchants and people who were accepting uh, Bitcoin as a payment method uh, because it just increased the risk of double spends. And uh, I think a lot of businesses ended up filtering out uh, those types of transactions anyway, and you had to wait 10 minutes. There was no such thing as like instant payments anymore. Um, so there's some things that happened as a result of uh, the inability to increase the block size, uh, the decision of those developers. And we see on this chart here, this is the total cryptocurrency market cap. Um, I just updated this one today, but uh, Basically, when the blocks became full at the start of 2017, which is when the last bull market was getting into swing, um, Bitcoin couldn't really keep up with the demand. And so people started going to other cryptocurrencies, which were actually directly competing with Bitcoin. And uh, all the money was flowing in there to like do things and businesses were starting to like build on these other coins as well. Um, I'm sure you know how successful Ethereum was with all these new startup companies and even other cryptocurrencies apart from Ethereum. Um, and then we've also got here the average transaction fee. And you can see basically on Bitcoin average, it was it was nothing, uh, less than a dollar for most of the time period of its existence up until when the this block size debate started uh, heating up. And uh, you can see that yeah, when the bull market kicked off at the start of 2017, transaction fees started going over a dollar. It went to five dollars, and then ten dollars. And by the peak of the bull market, the average transaction fee spiked to 55 US dollars there. So at this point, um, 
a lot of people had lost faith in Bitcoin and uh, as a result, yep, it lost its market cap to other cryptocurrencies who are in direct competition with it. They're all competing for the, the same customers basically and a lot of businesses chose to build their product on competing coins instead of Bitcoin uh, since it was unable to handle this increased load and demand during the bull market. A lot of merchants that were accepting Bitcoin as a method of payment dropped support for Bitcoin. Uh, this included Microsoft, who had taken on board four years prior to that, uh, Dell, Expedia, and Steam. Um, and these are all popular websites like Steam, uh, the biggest game store on PC, so all the PC gamers are buying their computer games through there. They dropped support. Um, and the other crap part about what happened was more people joined Bitcoin just to speculate on the price uh, rather than to use it as a currency, rather than to use it as a replacement to their bank accounts. And uh, basically price speculation is the lowest level of cryptocurrency involvement you can have and it doesn't benefit the, uh, the rest of the ecosystem at all because if you just buy Bitcoin on the, on the exchange and it doesn't leave the exchange, you just like buy and sell uh, between US dollars, you're not uh, supporting any of the merchants who are accepting it as a method of payment or putting your money back into the ecosystem. It's just gambling online. Um, and then, yeah, ultimately this all led to the first uh, major chain split on Bitcoin. So some people will tell you that uh, when Bitcoin splits, where it has a fork, uh, these are an airdrop and it was given away by the entity that created the coin. And this is simply not true. Uh, what they're doing is intentionally trying to discredit uh, competing versions of Bitcoin in defense of a version that they themselves favor. So a lot of BTC maximalists who are maximalists on BTC today, they will, they will say this. I was arguing with some this week and they were just unable to uh, comprehend the truth. Uh, but an, an airdrop is basically when you create your own coin, a brand new blockchain uh, that starts with block one and you have like a certain amount of the supply pre-mined to yourself and they give away the coins. This is not the case with forks of Bitcoin because the, the forks of Bitcoin, uh, unless they've just copied the code and started from scratch, uh, which, but this is not the case with Bitcoin Cash and a few other ones, they share the same history up to the Genesis block, which is the first block. So every uh, block and all the transactions contained within these blocks, up to the block height at which the chain split occurs, that's a shared history. And so uh, basically what, what's happening there is that uh, pe groups of people, miners, have failed to reach consensus and they run incompatible versions of the protocol at a certain block height. And it causes the blockchain to diverge into two separate networks with different rule sets. Um, so yeah, it literally splits like a fork in the road and both sides, them respective miners, continue to add blocks to each blockchain. Um, so with the Bitcoin Cash fork, there was no consensus reached. Uh, there was some stuff going on which we explained before. And so it diverged into two networks with two separate rule sets. And um, yeah, that's what Bitcoin Cash did, as I explained before. So basically, it looks like that, um, as I just explained. Uh, and that was the reason reasoning for splitting the blockchain, because uh, another group of people had decided that they wanted to pursue uh, digital gold. And in order to do that, uh, they say that it cannot be a method of payment first. Apparently that comes years later down the track. Uh, so they didn't care about high fees or the unreliability of the network. Um, whereas other people did. A lot of the early supporters that had got into Bitcoin, a lot of the early investors, a lot of the businesses, we're not in agreement with that, um, and so basically uh, they left. And uh, forking in uh, blockchain is a form of freedom, and that's what it allowed these people to do. Um, basically, the only thing that has been retained by um, the group that 
still run the Bitcoin Core software to this day is the BTC ticker symbol. And if you look back into the past, uh, they didn't, that version of Bitcoin didn't even have the BTC ticker symbol through its entire life. It was previously XBT, and some exchanges like Kraken still use XBT. So <laughs> it's literally just a ticker symbol. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be, uh, if you're like a Bitcoin Cash supporter or something, it's not really too concerning that they've retained that because that's all it is. It's just uh, identifying the blockchain that is traded on the exchange. Hey, hey. Yep. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the previous slide, you made a comment that um, uh, the chamber is, is due to the fate of the rift to test some of the miles. So at a technical level, that's true for you. You don't get any chain from a split without miners yep. choosing to mine the, the, the other chain. But really, the thing that's behind that is, is really social consensus, isn't it? You know, yes. It, essentially, there was no there was no central social consensus on how to move forward with scaling. One group thought this, one group thought the other. Off they went, argument finish, different chains move forward. And then as we go forward to the next slide, it was kind of the same same conversation on the BCH chain. Is that played out again, or less, you know, more disagreement about how to carry the BCH forward? But there was no social consensus again. So unfortunately, you know, that's true. Yep. So it's kind of. I got that in the next yeah. slide too. Oh, sorry. Don't, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that now. Yeah. Did you have anything else to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Just, just, just the point about the mining consensus versus the social consensus. Yeah. So the social consensus, if that fails, then ultimately. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yep. So can I ask you just back up one, one second, one slide, I guess. So here, your fork is not necessarily like a typical fork in a row. You're actually that first block all the way to the left. But you have Bitcoin and a wallet, and then you hit the fork. You essentially have value in the new Bitcoin cash as well as Bitcoin, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you... I'm just keying in on what you said you're, what you're discussing with people about the airdrop. Yeah. yeah, so you own the private keys to some bitcoins and uh, it has a corresponding public key and these block, uh, the, sorry, the key pairs exist on both blockchains still, so like... Uh, so you simply have value in both, both yeah. for X and for And it's not, it's not an airdrop, it's just that the blockchain has diverged and uh, they have gone separate ways and miners continue mining them. There's something else that happens called uh, orphaning and uh, that's normally when uh, uh, a divergence like this happens by accident and then the miner ends up uh, choosing uh, which side to continue with and they, they leave that one as a dead end and it's orphaned at that point. Yeah. But with this one, uh, there's groups of miners who have continued to mine it intentionally, basically, and they intentionally split it too. And that's an important point because it is like a typical fork in the road for the miners. They have to pick one, one path. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what happened. And then uh, fast forward to where we are today, and it's happened a number of other times from the BTC chain. Uh, we've got Bitcoin Gold and Bitcoin Diamond, just as an example. They're the only two ones that were in the like top 100 on coin market cap to this day. Um, so if there's any other ones, they're irrelevant. Um, and yeah, I don't even hear much about those ones at all. I'm not really sure what's going on there, but um, definitely still a lot going on with the Bitcoin Cash, uh, with BTC, and now there is one called uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision, which recently just uh, split on the uh, Bitcoin Cash chain. Uh, so there were some disagreements once again in the Bitcoin Cash community about what uh, was going to go on. And uh, there's more about it explained later in this presentation, but basically uh, there's a group of people that believed that they did not want to make any changes to the Bitcoin protocol at all. They wanted to basically fossilize it, which is kind of similar to what I thought the BTC group did. They didn't really want to innovate. 
on chain. They wanted to take everything on second layer solutions that was not on the base layer of the blockchain. And um, but with this group, they wanted to do everything on the blockchain. They just didn't want to modify it past the version 0.1. They said. They said everything was there in 0.1 that it ever needed to be, and um, we will just fix all the bugs and stuff. And uh, then you can build your applications on top, and we'll massively increase the block size, and that's all we need to do. So that's basically what they thought. Sorry, Adam. So SP is their own blockchain. Yeah, they are now it's since it's November. Their own. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and it's the their other group. And they made their own. Yeah. And the other group who has retained the BCH ticker symbol the and who is running the same software that split off from BTC originally. It's the same software from 2017 that has now retained the ticker in 2018 when the split happened. Uh, yeah, that, it's called the Bitcoin ABC protocol. And uh, this group believe that basically uh, what Satoshi had at v version 0 0.1 is not sacred and we can improve and extend the protocol with things that were not in existence at that point in time. And I think that's a pretty logical thing uh, so to expect. Bitcoin cash no, they are now their own coin. Their own coin. Yeah, it's called Bitcoin SV. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's great, right? Satoshi's vision. Yeah, what is Bitcoin Black? Bitcoin Black? I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> it's clearly not true. Yeah, there's a lot of them now. Yeah. These, as I said, these were the only ones that were within the top 100 on point mark cap. So I don't think any of the other ones are really um, relevant. Uh, but they have. Yes, and there's also. Um, I think this is where some of those airdrop guys were getting confused, but people can take the Bitcoin code and replicate it and start mining it on its own brand new blockchain. And that's what happened with Litecoin. Uh, so the guy took the code and he tweaked a few things and then uh, started mining it brand new. It wasn't a fork or, or Bitcoin. Well, technically it was, but it was not. the, the chain did not split. Um, but he just took the code. So yeah, um, that's where it's at now. Uh, there's a number of different versions, but they all share the same history up to the point at which they diverged, and it all goes back to the Genesis block. So if I had Bitcoin prior to 2016, before the first cash split, I would have, if it was in a wallet, I'd have bits of Bitcoin, cash, SV, gold, diamond, and BTC. Yeah. If you opened up like the corresponding wallet for that cryptocurrency, you would just import your private key and you would have access to it. Um, but uh, some of these, uh, they implement something called replay protection. And that is when, uh, so when Bitcoin Cash happened, this was implemented uh, and it stopped you from sending the transaction on both blockchains at the same time. So if it just split and I sent a transaction from my wallet without, and it didn't have replay protection, the same transaction would be transmitted on both blockchains and it could lead to loss of funds if you didn't know what you're doing. So um, by implementing replay protection, it only goes on the one blockchain. And with the recent uh, split that occurred on Bitcoin Cash, there was no replay protection. They like refused to implement it because that would uh, concede them, uh, concede defeat for them, they believed. And uh, I don't know why they still haven't done it, but uh, I actually thought it was more convenient because all I did was send the one transaction to an exchange and it automatically split. They had they supported uh, the automatic splitting of your coins when you send those. So I thought it was a lot more convenient. Um, and then like you could sell it off or do whatever you want with it a lot more easily. Um, so yeah, basically, this is just a summary of what each coin is going to do now. Uh, BTC wants to be digital gold and a store of value. Uh, a lot of them believe that you should buy it for the long term and not spend it now so you can get Lambos later down the track. And that is literally what they believe. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the BTC supporters that uh, I've talked to, they do not spend it and they advocate for using credit cards. 
Uh, a lot of the thought leaders of BTC, they say, uh, just use credit cards. You get like great uh, deals from the bank company. And they give you like 5% uh, uh, bonus or something. And uh, there was one recently in Brisbane. His name was Tone Bays, if you heard of him. And we were at the bar after the Bitcoin meetup. And I said, oh, right, so you're going to show me spending like Bitcoin or Lightning Network here? I want to see you do it. And he didn't even have any Bitcoin on his phone to spend, which was just crazy. Um, and uh, that appears to be the case for most of these people. There's another one, his name is Jimmy Song, and he goes around and he, he, uh, he's actually a Bitcoin core developer, this guy, and he does like workshops for people on developing for Bitcoin around the globe, and he charges like these fans of his uh, money to attend, which is fine. But then he also runs dinners as well, and none of these uh, events accept Bitcoin as a payment option. He wants you to just pay with your credit card or whatever, and he gets it in the bank account. And it's so, like, what? These guys are somehow, they're, they're having involvement in Bitcoin, but they do not uh, advocate for using it at all, and they're, in fact, advocating for the use of uh, traditional banking systems. It's very odd. And I've seen other people as well, who are BTC supporters, they, they believe that um, the banks have already won, or credit card companies have already won, and there's no point in challenging them because of this. So we should just attempt to be a store of value instead because that is still achievable, supposedly. That's what they think anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, so Bitcoin, thanks to the decisions of these devs today, it's limited to like five transactions per second maximum. Um, it's still under heavy load, even during a bear market <laughs> right now. Um, and uh, it received negative merchant adoption because of these decisions. Uh, the CTO of Blockstream, who is basically in control of the development of Bitcoin BTC at the moment, says that Bitcoin is not for people that live on less than $2 a day in response to like uh, queries about the high fees. And uh, they're relying on second layer solutions like the Lightning Network for scaling for payments in the long term. Now, this is something um, that was announced when they formed the company in 2014. They like, had a white paper a month later about this Lightning Network technology. Uh, and there's an ongoing joke uh, that, oh, it'll just be ready in 18 months because all these years ago they said, oh, it's going to be ready in 18 months and you can start using it. But that was never the case. So now when anything Lightning Network related is mentioned, it'll be, oh, yeah, it's ready in 18 months. But the problem with that is that people don't want to wait for some technology to maybe work later down the track. They want they want to use something that works today and that they can start using to change their life today. Um, a lot of people in these countries like Venezuela has been totally destroyed by the communism. Uh, they, they're using cryptocurrencies there like Dash and uh, Bitcoin Cash and other ones that just work as a currency. Um, and it's clearly a huge need for it. Well, you can, uh, I've actually documented using Lightning Network pretty extensively on my YouTube channel, the CoinSpice one, if you want to go look at that. Um, but they, there's a new breed of Lightning wallets that, are, that has come out recently. There's one called Blue Wallet, and there's one released by a company in Brisbane called Living Room Satoshi. Um, but that both these wallets, they are forfeiting uh, the access to your private keys. So you are not actually in control of the money. You are uh, giving the company that operates the wallet full custody of your funds, and you can't see what's going on in the back end because their stuff's all closed source. So there's, uh, they're, they're doing that because it seems that the only way to make the Lightning Network easier to use is to make it custodial. And what it has ended up becoming, uh, and many people have been predicting this years ago, it's kind of like a bank <laughs> because you're not getting control of your private keys and they are managing all the channel opening and closings in the back end and there's not really much going on that you know about. Um, and even then, I put it head to head uh, with the Bitcoin Cash and it's still uh, inferior the user experience. Uh, it basically takes you 10 minutes to onboard someone to Lightning uh, and start spending Lightning, and it's not actually real Bitcoin payments. Um, 
you're just transacting on the Lightning Network, you don't get any access to BTC, you can't withdraw your BTC uh, that is supposedly backing these Lightning payments that you can make. And uh, yeah, it takes 10 minutes to onboard them. This is an improvement over the other Lightning wallet which uh, gives you access to private keys, but the onboarding process takes up to 50 minutes. And then if you want to onboard someone to Bitcoin Cash, which functions as Bitcoin did prior to all this stuff going on, or the Bitcoin SV as well, by the way, because it's basically it's basically very similar at this point in time, um, you can onboard someone in less than a minute. So I can just say, download this app, and I send you a dollar, and then you can immediately send it on to go buy something with that. Um, and so yeah, it's not even like in the same realm of being able to compete at this point in time, but who knows what will happen later. Uh, I'm open to seeing what they've got to offer. Uh, that's why I tested it all out. Um, but it's been like four years now, and the Bitcoin market cap was uh, destroyed as a result of the stagnant development, and uh, people are just sick of waiting, so they forked off. That's basically what happened. <laughs> Um, and yeah, now they're all in direct competition with each other, so there's no complaints. Um, and uh, now, so Bitcoin Cash, a bit about that one. Basically, it just wants to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, a global payment system. They want to directly compete with Visa and MasterCard. Um, the payments are basically free. You don't need to worry about going to calculate your fee or whatever before you go and send a transaction so it goes through. Uh, they're reliable in that regard. And um, right now, with the 32 megabyte block size, it can do 100 transactions per second. This has been tested. They have done 100. Uh, sorry, they have done 32 megabyte blocks on Bitcoin Cash on the main net. So people were spamming transactions intentionally to stress test it and find out uh, if there was any problems in like relaying blocks and things like that. Um, but uh, the BSV blockchain has now taken it even further and they managed to do a 103 megabyte block um, and that's a lot of transactions. I, I did not calculate how many transactions per second that is, but hey, it's, it's a lot more. Is to become a miner or it, it, it works? Like, how, how's no, it I know a lot of miners. Where's it going? Uh, Where's it going? Mining? Mining, yeah. It's always going to be uh, good, but there is a higher barrier to entry now than there ever was. Like in the past, in the in these early years that we looked at before, you could mine at home on a laptop and then you could only mine with like some graphics cards in your desktop and then you had to buy like an ASIC miner and now there's people with warehouses full of them. And uh, yeah, basically now if you want to be not mining with a pool, like mining on your own, so you get 100% of the reward, you need to invest hundreds of millions of dollars so for, for BTC. Mining. Why not? I'm not saying I do, I'm just saying. <laughs> there are, there are many people who did. Uh, that guy... And what, what are the keys to mining? Like, what, do you, what are the three major things to become a successful miner? Well, um... It's really like one turn on investment. I can tell you that the miners yeah, yeah, who have been mining like for longer are doing a lot better than the miners who just started in 2017. A lot of the miners who started in 2017 have like switched off or given up because it's just like not as profitable during the bear market. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah I know so many miners would have switched off um, during these lows, and actually switching off helps reduce the difficulty in finding blocks and. Um, yeah, but still, you might be mining at a loss. It wouldn't be able to cover all your power and stuff like that. So unless you had an insane amount of fiat currency to back up your operation, um, that would be the only way you could feasibly do it. Or start mining right now. You wouldn't be able to do it if you're holding so cryptos. You have the equity in, in, in your expenses. Right. Yeah, I, I think if you want to get into mining now, you need to have a good amount of fiat currency I don't want to get into to sustain that kind of an operation, yeah. But uh, anyway, um, yeah. Right now, the hundred transactions per second is about PayPal scale. So this one's already competing head to head with PayPal uh, very easily. 
Um, they've, as I mentioned before, they've tested it up to like 380 gigabyte blocks, which is 100 times the visa scale. And uh, when they get two terabyte blocks later down the track, that is like, uh, hang on, is seven? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's terabyte blocks, seven million transactions per second. So I guess that's the future where they're aiming to be. I know that they are in like May this year, they will upgrade the block size from uh, the limit that caps it at 32 megabytes. They will lift that up to 128. Um, and the BSV blockchain, that was part of the reason why they split away, because they wanted to do it now, in November. They didn't want to wait until uh, this year. So that was just one of the reasons. Um, and a lot of people backing that BSV chain, they were they had invested in their own mining hardware, by the way. They had uh, like the biggest, they were the biggest miner on Bitcoin Cash after investing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars all year. Um, and yeah, you can't charge back. Uh, there's plenty of merchant support since it split away from BTC in 2017. And then we've got the Bitcoin Satoshi vision. None of the BSV boys are here today, like Brendan, but I'm sure it would have had some stuff to say about this. Um, so it's basically pretty similar to Bitcoin Cash being real um, since they just forked. But the primary differences are that They've stated that they want to be a government-friendly version of Bitcoin, and they do not endorse illegal activities, such as the activities that occur on marketplaces like the Silk Road. So I'm not sure how they're going to be policing that, but that's what they want to do. Um, they, If you go to the official Satoshi's Vision website, it says down the bottom, it is owned by uh, the BCom Association on behalf of the global BSV community, which I think is a bit confusing as well. I'm not sure like, why you would want to support this if it's claiming to be owned by a single entity. When you look at the who this BCom Association is, it is, uh, it is just a shell company uh, that these miners who decide to run their own incompatible version of the Bitcoin Cash protocol. Um, yeah, it's just a shell company that they own, and there are many other shell companies too that they release things through to make it look like they have more support. But anyway, that's that's what they're doing. If you look into it, it's got it's like openly admitted. If you go on the website, they have like the the leaders of this organization. It's all the same people. Um, so yeah, basically. Uh, the same, the same people. Uh, they've been filing a lot of patents, and they've been saying that, uh, like, you are free to use our patents if uh, you, what you're building and what is using that patent is on our coin, on BSV. And previously, they were doing that with the Bitcoin Cash, uh, but now that's moved to BSV, um, and they are. They've said that they will be enforcing all these patents. So the guy, one of the leaders, has been like threatening other altcoins and stuff like that every week. You can see him this week he was attacking the one called Tron and saying that they're infringing on his patents and he's going to enforce them. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but it seems like they think that through enforcing their patents, they will get more people to start using their coin. Um, I don't know, and they're also threatening open source software developers, which is really weird as well, not cool. Um, so they also do not want to modify the Bitcoin past version 0.1, as I said before, uh, except for fixing bugs that were in the protocol at the time. So there was many uh, problems with Bitcoin 0.1, like yeah, some bugs where you could uh, just generate some new coins out of thin air and that would affect the total supply of 21 million. Uh, a lot of other problems like uh, that had been fixed in previous versions of Bitcoin. And uh, I find that uh, a bit odd as well because um, they say it's Satoshi's vision and we do not want to change it past 0 0.1 because there's a single quote from Satoshi that says, uh, the core, uh, sorry, since version 0 0.1, uh, the core design of Bitcoin was set in stone. 
So they uh, literally believe that uh, it must not be modified beyond that. And everything that you want to do can be done with that, uh, but we'll just increase the block size and everything that we build is going to be done on top of the protocol. So kind of things like the Lightning Network, but without crippling the block size at the same time. Um, and I saw recently they've been doing some other stuff where they've been allowing people to upload and store files onto their blockchain. And so basically the file, an image, you pay like a higher fee to store this file on there. It might be a dollar or five dollars depending on how big the file is. Um, but then that fee goes to the miners and your data is then stored on the blockchain kind of like that little text string that Satoshi did with the Genesis block, but this time you can do images and stuff through some OP codes like OP return, which is a function that was actually disabled by those core developers. And this is something that um, Bitcoin Cash has re-enabled as well. Um, and it allows you to do all sorts of stuff like the tokenization. Um, Bitcoin Cash is doing that as well through a different method, but uh, this coin is also doing it on the base layer of Bitcoin. And um, yeah, that's actually another problem where the core developers stuffed up because as we know, Ethereum became really massive and other coins doing tokenization and smart contracts. Um, that could all have been done on Bitcoin, actually. So this is what these, coin, these versions are doing now. And um, finally, they also believe in just massively scaling on-chain right now. They want to like rush to gigabyte size blocks in the very near future, probably like another year away in 2020, they want to be doing like gigabyte size block limit. And um, yeah, you can find out more about their roadmap on the website, I guess. But um, there doesn't appear to be any demand for these blocks just yet. It was an issue obviously on BTC when they were becoming full, um, but when they're not full, there's not such demand uh, on these other coins just yet. But I think what they're trying to do is um, if you have the infrastructure and it's got the capacity to do certain things, then other companies like massive corporations and stuff can come to Bitcoin and start using it for all the transactions and they need to do and all the tokenization <coughs> stuff. So that's part of the reason why they believe that we need to like massively increase right now so that these large enterprises can come to Bitcoin and start using it for everything. But it's Craig, right? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. he's the guy who's basically in charge of what's going on there. Who gave an address in service. Yeah. And actually what's interesting with him, um, he has been claiming that he is as well. Yeah. Um, but when he claimed he was in like 2015 or 2016, um, he said he would provide proof to the BBC. And then a few days later, there's another article and it's like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it, he says. And he was unable to provide evidence. But since then, yeah, he's still been involved in the Bitcoin. Uh, when he was in Bitcoin Cash, he, when he started backing the Bitcoin Cash uh, for um, he was saying a lot of things that were like factually correct and was one of the only people who was aggressively saying it. You know, like, oh, we need to obviously increase the block size. It's been stagnant for years on this other version. And saying all sorts of stuff that I would still agree with to this day. But then, uh, yeah, I kind of diverted from supporting him when they started saying, oh, we want to be government friendly and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I didn't. Also, I also didn't agree with uh, keeping the protocol set in stone, fossilized. I think uh, a lot of the things I've seen happening recently even just confirm my decision. But it looks to be um, best to innovate and extend the protocol in order to compete with all these other cryptocurrencies that now exist. Um, because yeah, they're all in direct competition, and by bringing in better features and tools that enhance the overall user experience. And even if you're not a fan of some of the features that can come, it's still beneficial because it opens it up to more people who do 
want those features. Like, I'm not a big fan of the tokenization stuff personally. I just like payments. Um, but I'm okay with them doing tokens because clearly some people do have a need for those. And, and yeah, that's, that's really all it's about. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. Uh, that's basically where we are with Bitcoin today. Um, go and do your own research on some of the stuff that I told you about today. Um, and invest accordingly in whatever you want to believe in because there are a number of different versions of Bitcoin today um, and they all share the same history up to the point at which they went their separate paths. So, you know, you can look at the history, see what worked, what's not working so well and uh, make a decision. Um, so yeah, the next meetup, uh, Tuesday the 12th of February, it'll be right here. And uh, yeah, I asked Gabriel to come and talk about uh, the tokens on Bitcoin Cash. He's like one of the guys who have been spearheading all this. Um, and there's also a developer toolkit that he has built. Uh, it's accessible on the developer.bitcoin.com website, I believe. And you can go there. There's a lot of uh, resources and code snippets and stuff like that for building things on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. Um, and it will also talk about something called Badger Wallet, which is basically, uh, they forked MetaMask for Ethereum, and now there is basically MetaMask on Bitcoin Cash, and uh, it's uh, it appears to be the best web browser wallet at this point in time. So, it's pretty good, and um, it's enabling the tokens to happen on Bitcoin Cash as well. So, he'll come talk about all that at this next meetup. And that's all. So, bye.